Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to present this short course. Um, so this is a course on rapid thermal design and modeling and analysis of space flight instruments. Um, and throughout this course, I'll be providing a couple of guidelines from NASA Goddard's Integrated Design Center. Um, so I'd uh, like to introduce my co-authors on this as well, uh, Hume Peabody and Rachel Rivera. Um, they both contributed significantly to this work. Um, so let me start off with just explaining what um, rapid thermal design of space flight instruments entails. Uh, so this short course, it's really intended to provide a general overview of how to conduct rapid th instrument thermal design modeling analysis. And it's informed by the processes in NASA's design labs. Now for typical flight projects, right, you would, uh, if you're working a flight project, you'll develop um, an initial instrument thermal model and then you'll iterate it over a project's lifespan. Uh, a model is developed for uh, initial concept studies. You know, perhaps you have a couple of weeks or a couple of months to actually do that. And then you'd refine it um, over subsequent months or years between each of the project milestones, depending on the length of the project. So, um, you know, you'd probably have a, a revision, a major revision at the mission concept review, um, followed by PDR and CDR, uh, systems integration review, for example. And in each iteration, uh, engineers would refine their thermal models and thermal designs in accordance with updates from other subsystems. You would perform trade studies. You'd solve very detailed, very complex analysis problems. Uh, look at worst cases, look at contingencies, perhaps do a launch analysis or um, thermal vacuum analysis, and then pick hardware and then you plan for testing and integration. Um, however, um, prior to any project being established, um, and especially if you're looking at proposals or if you're looking at an early conceptual stage for a design, usually you don't have that luxury of time. And what happens if you don't actually, you know, you can't do multiple instrument design iterations? Um, how do you complete a thermal model or explore multiple possible instrument configurations? And also, what are the critical parameters for your model, right? What details do you actually include? What details do you leave out so that you capture what's important for rapid thermal design? Um, so just a little bit of background here, uh, NASA does maintain uh, many design labs at many of its centers and facilities to develop rapid instrument and mission concepts. Um, typically, if you're supporting one of these labs, um, they ask you to quickly analyze and develop a design within a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks, uh, to create a finished product uh, consistent between all subsystems. Um, now the process is, um, you know, because this is done on a typical basis within the design labs. The processes practiced by NASA's design labs do provide ideal guidelines for understanding how to conduct rapid thermal design modeling and analysis. And um, of course, you know this is this is not even inclusive of all the design labs that got, uh, at uh, at uh, the agency as a whole at, at NASA as a whole. Um, and there's a lot of other design labs in government, in, in industry, in academia. Um, and there's also multiple ways to approach the challenges of rapid conceptual design. Um, so for this specific short course, we're just looking at the guidelines from the Instrument Design Laboratory, which is um, part of the Integrated Design Center at NASA Goddard's, uh, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Now, um, just a, a little more background on the Integrated Design Center. The Integrated Design Center does provide an environment that facilitates multidisciplinary, concurrent, collaborative space systems engineering design analysis activities and it allows for rapid development of science instrumentation and mission architecture concepts. So um, the IDC, the Integrated Design Center, it's been in existence since 1997, um, and the Instrument Design Library actually has performed hundreds of instrument studies since then. So it's really refined and sharpened this process for rapid instrument design. Um, and you know, if you're a thermal engineer supporting the Instrument Design Laboratory, um, you would follow you know, a very, um, a, a rapid design process where um, essentially thermal modeling is adapted to the dynamic engineering environment where all subsystems work together within a couple of days towards a consistent point design. So this short course, the, the guidelines from it really originate from the experience and lessons learned over two decades of ideal thermal design. Um, and the objectives here really are to provide a, a condensed guide for the most efficient way to develop thermal models and conduct thermal analysis. Uh, the time span that we're looking at is one to two weeks. And uh, 
to quantify the resources that are actually needed to provide thermal control for the focus instrument, and then to talk about tall poles or lessons learned for each type of interest instrument. And you know, the, the instrument design lab, very much like all of the other design labs uh, across the agency, right, they design for um, things across the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and, uh, you know, there's um, a lot of crude, um, you know, centers that actually uh, focus on um, crude missions as well that design for astronaut deployed instruments as well. So within the course, the, the short course, I'm just going to be covering, you know, specific um, designs for each of these types of instruments, as well as any uh, lessons learned from, from them. Um, so this slide provides a, a general overview of um, what I'm going to be covering today, right? And it's uh, in two parts. The first part is the rapid thermal design process. I'm going to talk about each of the steps that are actually here. Um, the first step is determining boundary conditions. Second is determining worst case thermal environments. A third is to gather thermal inputs from other disciplines. And the fourth is determining your temperature zones. Um, and you can see all of these uh, are under the general umbrella of thermal requirements. Um, then the really the model building phase is here, right? So you build a preliminary thermal model, you iterate the technical design with other disciplines and then perform model checks. Uh, and then I'll conclude that section with some uh, typical discipline analysis products. Um, and then I'll uh, start the second section talking about specific instrument thermal design examples. Um, so really that features the, the following types of instruments kind of across the electromagnetic spectrum, right? From the longest wavelengths uh, with microwave and RF systems um, to optical and then um, to lasers, X-rays, gamma rays is uh, the highest um, or the, the shortest wavelengths, um, highest frequencies. And then uh, I'll end with a, some um, guidelines on astronaut operated instruments and uh, robotic planetary landers. Um, so if it's okay with the hosts as well, um, uh, I would like to take a, a short break between these two. Is that all right? It'll probably be about an hour in. Yes, no problem. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, let me start off with the section on the rapid thermal design process. So the um, first step, of course, is to determine your boundary conditions. Um, so for instruments, right, this is all about determining where the spacecraft will be mounted with respect to the space, or I'm sorry, the instrument will be mounted with respect to the spacecraft. So if that information isn't available yet, um, or if, you know, very early on in the design process, this particular spacecraft hasn't been chosen yet, um, typically what happens is that you can make assumptions to spacecraft interface temperature and orientation uh, with respect to the spacecraft bus. And, you know, of course, there would be educated assumptions based on what the science of the mission is. Um, for microwave, um, RF, or for optical instruments. Um, so one of the really big lessons learned that we've uh, had from many years in the IDL is to um, ensure that either your radio frequency RF instruments or your optical um, instruments, their designs um, have been solidified by those engineers responsible for it. Um, and the reason for this is because that even small changes within the placement of, uh, you know, certain microwave or RF components, you know, antennas, feed horns, um, or optical components, they can result in vastly different mechanical packaging and thermal control methods. Um, so really, it's critical that the designs are frozen before thermal modeling begins. And, you know, it doesn't have to be the final design, of course. Um, it can be just um, a frozen iteration of that design so that thermal modeling can occur. Because one of the things that we've noticed is that it, even small changes within those components can result in, in very large uh, differences in, in uh, thermal designs. Uh, one of the other things to just establish is a common coordinate system, right? It allows for easy reference and communication with the other members of your team. It's surprising how much um, this particular point is actually um, omitted, you know, through a lot of earlier designs, just because of the, you know, the short time scales and um, the, the difficulty with performing all of your work while communicating with the other um, engineers. But, um, you know, this is immensely helpful later, um, especially if there needs to be, you know, certain mappings or certain information transferred between multiple models. The second step here is to determine the worst case thermal environments. Um, so typically, 
a, a simple cube model, uh, very much like the one shown down here, it's sufficient to discreetly quantify temperature changes due to heat flux on each side of the spacecraft's thermal environment. Um, and it also allows you to determine your worst case thermal environments for Earth or any other types of planetary orbits, uh, including moons. Um, so, you know, when I say a simple cube model, it's really just one arithmetic node on each side of the cube. It has coding properties um, of alpha equals one, epsilon equals one. And this allows for a rapid way to examine your heat fluxes per orbit, um, as well as determine which sides are suitable for radiators, which side require MLI. Um, so, you know, it's extremely quick to run. Uh, you just place it into the orbit. You, you know, it's very easy to determine um, where your heat fluxes are. Um, simple trade studies can also be performed with different coatings and different MLI. And if, of course, if thermal stability is a concern, then a cube model is a really good test bed for materials and corresponding thicknesses to achieve the desired thermal mass and thermal stability that you're looking for. Um, if the resultant temperatures really aren't um, cold enough for passive thermal control, then uh, you can, you know, look into adding an earth shield or a planetary shield um, to achieve the desired radiator radiator temperatures. Um, cube models are also a really good place to start for sun shield design. Uh, in fact, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of telescope studies and other things um, started with something very, very similar. Um, so, you know, it, it's a good place to, to understand the number of sun shield layers that you need, the spacing between the layers, um, and what coatings you use on your sun shields um, until acceptable average temperatures are achieved on your cube. Um, and in more exotic environments, such as planetary landers, it's actually helpful to understand the environmental parameters um, that you need for thermal modeling beforehand as well. So uh, things like um, atmospheric composition, right? Um, if there's an atmosphere to wherever you're landing, uh, the uh, equivalent of convective co coefficients at different layers of the atmosphere, especially if you have some type of probe that's coming through an atmosphere, uh, your cold sky temperatures, your diffuse sky radiation and heating, um, average ground temperatures, this is actually fairly important, especially in those places where uh, you don't have an atmosphere, um, because there might be very large changes in the ground temperatures. Um, in the position of the sun or other celestial bodies, uh, a lot of times you can capture this as a vector list, right, a solar vector list over time. If you're sufficiently close to a planet as well, you can have a planetary vector list versus time. Um, and then um, if, you know, if you're Atmosphere is significantly thick, though, that might not be a concern. Um, and then in deep space or planetary orbits, it might be easier to establish your orbit as a list of vectors um, and their corresponding heat fluxes. So here are some common sources um, that actually you would gather thermal inputs from other disciplines from. Um, and, you know, I'm separating this from common sources and unique sources because common sources are more the disciplines that you are typically involved with in an early spacecraft instrument design uh, versus unique sources, you know, they might be more mission specific, right? Um, depending on the, the requirements of that particular mission and that particular science objective, uh, you would have uh, certain unique sources that you deal with. So um, when you're gathering thermal inputs, um, one of the really big ones is uh, for gathering inputs from detectors um, and electro-optical. And by electro-optical, I mean uh, more, you know, the radiometry engineer or right from radiometric analysis. Um, so a lot of times you would get uh, things like a temperature requirement from the te detectors engineer, a temperature stability requirement. Stability is really important, um, especially when you're dealing with detectors. Um, dissipations, all right, um, quantities, um, geometry and dimensions, mass and coatings. Um, from your electrical engineer, you would get the number of electrical boxes, uh, your power dissipations for those boxes, your dimensions and masses for those boxes, uh, temperature requirements. Um, and then from mechanical engineers, right, uh, you might get a, some type of snapshot of the mechanical packaging, uh, including geometry and dimensions. Um, and, you, you know, you can see some of the, the other um, parameters that are actually there. A big one uh, would be radiator placement, right? Um, what is defined as the cold side of the spacecraft, how large um, of an area is it uh, that you can place radiators. Um, your optical uh, engineers, they might provide temperature requirements or temperature stabilities. Um, gradient requirements might be a very large one, especially when you're dealing with optics. Um, and of course, geometry and dimensions, mass and coatings of those optics. 
uh, RF communications or RF microwave engineers, right? You have uh, power dissipations on their components, um, your typical temperature requirements or stabilities. Um, reliability engineers might provide a redundancy requirement based on the mission class. Um, and then your structural engineers provide material selection, material thicknesses, um, especially if you know the, the goal is to lightweight, then they might um, specify that certain composites need to be used. Um, and then your systems engineers uh, typically provide a summary of the thermal design requirements, um, any orbital parameters or mass or power allocations for thermal components, um, especially if it's a, a fairly small um, satellite or, or intended to be a fairly small instrument. Um, and then, um, you know, things like sun avoidance angles or pitch roll or yaw angles. Now, some of the unique sources that you might have um, that are very much science dependent are, um, are contamination, right? If you have a very, very sensitive instrument, um, things like a, an X-ray telescope or, or uh, for, for example, the IR telescope, um, you might have, um, you know, very uh, specific contamination requirements, um, things like, you know, the types of thermal coatings that you can actually use um, so that there's there's not significant degradation over the, the mission lifetime. Um, you know, you might have uh, requirements for decontamination um, or uh, you know, need for an outgas heater. Um, for cryogenics, right, uh, if you have a cryogenic system, especially if they're using things like a cryocooler or, or an adiabatic demagnetization refrigerator, an ADR, um, you might have, uh, you know, the specific power dissipations from them, the temperature requirements from them, um, the cold head temperature, right? Uh, cryo cooler thermal interfaces. Um, and, you know, typically um, to achieve a particular uh, temperature, uh, a particular cryogenic temperature at the, the cold head of the cryo cooler, um, you're going to have a lot of dissipations on the back end. So that's something that you would need to manage. Um, for integration and testing, um, you know, you might. Uh, it might require specialized ground support equipment um, for lasers. Lasers typically put off a lot of heat. So you're um, dealing with power dissipations. Um, you might have to deal with a lot of stabilities on, on laser optical heads as well. Um, and then for mechanisms, right, you have temperature requirements, you have um, power dissipations from them as well, especially if their duty cycle is high. And if you have an onboard battery, now keep in mind, I'm, I'm talking specifically about uh, instruments here, right? But um, there are certain instruments that have batteries on them. For example, um, if you're talking about, uh, you know, astronaut deployed instruments, um, then you do have battery temperature requirements, which tend to be strict, and you do have power profile uh, requirements as well, depending on the science cadence. Um, so step four here is to determine your temperature zones, right? And, and what do I mean by temperature zones? This might not be a, a very common terminology across the agency. So temperature zones really they help define your design requirements early on, and they help um, aid in grouping components with similar thermal requirements. Um, so really, it's it's kind of an exercise just to organize right which components go in which temperature bin, if you want to think about it that way. Um, in addition to operational and survival temperature limits, um, keep in mind that you want to track gradient and stability requirements as well, especially for sensitive optical components or, or detectors, for example. Um, and what this exercise helps you do is it helps you group the components that actually have thermal requirements that are very similar. And it also helps you identify areas where thermal control might be challenging. So for design studies, um, a lot of times because systems engineers are, um, you know, are, are uh, uh, essential part of the design process, and um, they're typically, you know, their job is really to communicate with all the disciplines and, and make sure that there's um, a good flow of information. Um, it might be more effective for systems engineers to coordinate the gathering of thermal requirements and determine uh, the thermal zones. Um, so as you can see here, right, this is a, a typical optical instrument. Um, you have some optical components here. You have a detector um, within a housing. Um, you have uh, front-end electronics. Um, that are reading out that detector, and then you have an electronics box back here uh, that might be doing the digitization of that data. So, um, you know, you have all the optical components here um, occupy one uh, thermal zone, so they're grouped into zone one here. Your detector has much more stringent requirements. It's grouped into a different zone. Um, but then your front-end electronics and your electronics box might have more relaxed requirements. So, of course, um, they can be in different zones. Um, sometimes, you know, you have um, front-end electronics and electronics boxes that are 
have different requirements because it's a very cold detector, for example. Um, sometimes they might actually occupy the same thermal zone, in which case you might be able to group them into one radiator. All right, so that was the gathering of thermal requirements. The next step is to build a preliminary thermal model. So um, before you begin, right, um, uh, some of the things that just really help um, so that you can ensure that, you know, thermal design goes pretty smoothly, that you don't really have to, to, um, uh, to stop for a lot of these, um, you know, more, I guess, um, housekeeping things is to uh, have a list of um, uh, common thermal, physical, and optical properties already available. So in thermal desktop, if, if you use thermal desktop, um, this might be a common, um, you know, TDP or RCO file. And um, really, this is just to feed in so that you don't have to look um, at, you know, look up material properties or, or coatings properties, for example, as you're rapidly trying to develop your thermal model. Um, list, having a list of common thermal conductances for uh, thermal interface materials is extremely helpful as well. And then starting with a template thermal model uh, file populated with simple shapes. Um, so you'd be surprised at how often, um, you know, how, how useful this actually is, right? Um, just starting off with a particular model that has um, an assortment of shapes in there in a line um, right, you can modify those uh, dimensions. You can reposition them. You can rotate them um, to match a mechanical CAD file very, very easily. So, um, things that are helpful to have in there: rectangular prisms. Right, uh, these represent the shapes of spacecraft buses, of electronics boxes, cylinders, especially if you have cylindrical buses or any rotating components, any struts, for example. Um, flat plates um, for optical benches or radiators. Um, this can also be, um, you know, you can also have just a honeycomb panel already available. Um, discs, um, you can use them for mirrors, you can use them for lenses, you can use them for filter wheels, um, for optical components. Uh, um, paraboloids for antennas. Uh, if you have a, a sphere or a spheroid, they can be used for pressure vessels, for example, on an instrument or prop tanks on a mission, uh, on the mission side. And then uh, just having a heat pipe available is actually surprisingly useful. Um, so, you know, it, it saves you from having to put in the properties and, and, um, uh, and you know, link all the nodes for a heat pipe already. Um, and, uh, you know, you can, of course, reposition it and, and rotate it to um, whatever components you need to actually transfer heat from. Um, and, you know, just a, a reiteration that you really don't need to start with a final mechanical model. Um, the uh, you know, mechanical engineer might have some type of interim model that they can actually port over to you uh, with a step file. So um, you can just start with a basic model and then refine later as the mechanical design matures. A couple more model building tips. Um, starting with generic values for interfaces um, is also uh, you know, useful, especially if you don't know exactly what those interfaces look like yet. Um, contactors, of course, are preferred over conductors. Um, you know, you can have various, um, uh, you know, you can have various values um, for um, conductance based on uh, if it's an isolated door or a conductive interface. Um, uh, for the conductors here, you can um, establish connectivity first and then determine if it's well coupled uh, or isolated, right? So um, this is specifically between nodes. If you're um, using um, particular surfaces, primitive shapes are actually preferred over finite elements because it allows for quick rediscretization of the mesh. Um, so if you're just using things like a rectangular prism, for example, right, um, it's very easy just to change, um, you know, the, the, um, the, re, the, well, change the discretization of that particular uh, surface. Um, and then, you know, one quick note is that you can disable a node within a surface um, that to represent a hole or an edge notch. That's just a, a very quick way to actually um, um, do that without, uh, you know, having to define a surface that actually has an opening where you would have one of those features. Um, a very important note here is to not start with too detailed of a nodal discretization. You can always refine that later. And then uh, to apply heat loads to surfaces rather than nodes if possible. So if you're rediscretizing that particular surface, you know, don't, your heat load doesn't automatically start moving. Um, and then use symbols for quick modification of parameters later. Uh, symbols are actually really helpful with conductances, with heat loads, 
um, and with translations and rotations of any moving assemblies, right? You can imagine if you just use a symbol for it, um, you can just use a symbol manager to change that particular parameter um, rather than having to go into uh, that feature itself and having to change it there. Uh, and using uh, steady state analyses when possible, right? Right now, in this very early stage of conceptual design, what you're aiming for is, um, you know, a, a, a good idea of worst case analyses for your particular instrument. So um, for worst case analyses, right, steady state analyses are good enough to really help you understand uh, what temperatures are achieved with those worst cases. Typically at this early stage, you only would use transient analyses if um, you had something that was highly uh, CONOPS dependent. So for example, if you have a, an astronaut deployed instrument, right, uh, you might only turn it on intermittently and then it might just, uh, you might just allow it to drift to atmosphere, you know, to a steady state with the environment afterwards. So for something like that, you might want to do a more transient analysis. But, you know, if you have something that's in, in Earth orbit, for example, or, um, you know, just sees a very constant thermal environment, of course, steady state analyses um, are the way to go. Um, so the next couple of slides really present some of the, the parameters that are used for worst case thermal analyses as a guideline. Um, and um, at NASA Goddard, we uh, very often deal with earth science instruments. So um, we talk about worst case stack parameters for thermal analysis in low earth orbit. Um, so these are typical parameters for a hot case and a cold case. I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with this, um, right? Um, you'd want to use the, the hottest environmental parameters um, and uh, you want to use the coldest uh, environmental parameters for, for, um, for a cold case, right? The hottest environmental parameters for a hot case, coldest environmental parameters for a cold case. Um, component power dissipations, right? You have max, um, or I should say heat load with contingency. Um, and then, um, right, for a cold case, you want to use the heat load best estimate with no contingency. Um, MLI blanketing, you want to use less effective emissivity on the cold side. Um, and then um, for a cold case, you want to have more effective emissivity on the cold side. And then for radiator coatings, um, right, BOL properties for a hot case, BOL properties for a cold case. Um, you use a hot case to size radiators, a cold case to size heaters. And then for a survival case, um, you use a reduced operational configuration. And um, you just want to ensure that there's sufficient heater circuits to meet survival limits. Um, and there's a note here that these values are representative of typical parameters uh, for nominally circular low Earth orbit. Um, but of course, they vary greatly for another uh, planetary or deep space orbit, um, and they are highly dependent on instrument orientation as well. Um, some, of the, some other references here, um, you actually have uh, thermal, for thermal hardware, right? Um, there's uh, a lot of different um, guidelines that you can use to estimate max and power. Um, and I'm not gonna go through uh, this chart in detail, but you can see some of the typical thermal components here, what their associated masses are, um, your powers um, for uh, these particular thermal components. Um, and they're based on uh, different types of, right, um, uh, you know, power requirements, or um, for example, if you use a controller, right, uh, that actually, uh, typic has a typical power associated with it. Um, a lot of these come from space mission analysis and design, but they also come from uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center Thermal Engineering Branch Centers. And then a couple of notes about thermal and power. Um, and these are really meant as sanity checks for an early um, thermal design. So um, historically, thermal subsystem masses are about 2 to 10% of spacecraft or instrument dry mass. So uh, if you have a purely passive thermal design, it's closer to that 2% range. If you have an active thermal design, it might be closer to a 10% range. And then the bulk of that mass would be MLI or any specialized thermal components. Um, <coughs> excuse me. For thermal control power uh, estimates, they typically only consist of heater power unless you use electronic controllers. Uh, power estimates are grouped into uh, two separate groups. So um, you might have operational power requirements. Um, you, know, you would use your coldest operational scenario to actually um, uh, get that power estimate. And um, you, you, know, you typically would use something like a mechanical thermostat or electronic controller, uh, depending on the stability requirement, right? to um, 
determine how you're going to control uh, a particular box or a particular surface. And then for survival, you use the coldest survival scenario. And circuits uh, should be controlled in the most reliable manner, so um, usually with mechanical thermostats. Excuse me. Um, moving on to typical component temperature ranges as well. Um, you have common temperature ranges for typical spaceflight instrument components. Now, um, these are really meant as examples that can be used for early conceptual design. Um, you know, and you can see certain categories of components that are actually here, electronics, boxes, antennas, batteries, mechanisms, right? Uh, an optical or a laser bench, um, some of the more specialized components down here. Um, these are, um, you know, often temperature ranges that we see for these classes of components. And you have some stability ranges here too, especially for optical or laser components. Now, um, of course, each piece of spaceflight hardware is different and has different temperature requirements. So as your design progresses, right, you can use these as placeholders uh, starting off on your conceptual design if you don't have anything better. But if you have a specific vendor provided part or if you have guidance from another engineer, then um, you can get um, the appropriate temperature requirements applicable to that uh, specific component in your instrument, in which case you would replace um, these general temperature ranges. For detector temperature ranges, um, they vary greatly based on instrument application. So um, the table below actually shows typical detector temperature, uh, operational temperatures based on instrument type. And keep in mind that detectors are typically the most challenging um, parts of your thermal design. So, um, you know, your detector, depending on the science application, right, and there's, um, you know, detectors presented across the electromagnetic spectrum here. So wavelength range, um, the portion of that electromagnetic spectrum, right, the, the example detector types that are associated with those um, operational temperatures. Um, if you look at these, right, especially with the IR instruments and, and um, terahertz instruments here, you have very, very low um uh, temperature ranges. Um, and these are extremely difficult to design to. And then you have very strict thermal stability requirements as well. Some of these, um, you know, you, you, um, it, it's extremely difficult to design to, but it, the science requirement actually necessitates it. Now, um, of course, each spaceflight instrument is different, and detector instruments are highly dependent on the science, the wavelengths that you're trying to measure and the temperatures needed to achieve this acceptable radiometric performance. So depending on the type of science that you're trying to do, you will actually um, receive a detector requirement from you know, a radiometric engineer, for example. Um, so um, really this table is meant to give you a general idea of um, you know, what types of thermal challenges that you might see um, at different instruments across the electromagnetic spectrum and uh, what type of stabilities that you have to design to and just uh, things to focus on to be aware of um, as you're building your conceptual design. So the sixth step here is to iterate your technical design with other disciplines. Um, and these talk about, talk to the technical exchanges that you might have with another engineer. Um, to a, major, in a, majority, a majority, excuse me, in a majority of early design studies. So, um, you know, let's just take the radiator, for example, right, as a topic of design iteration. Um, your radiator really depends on, um, on your conversations, your iterations with, um, you know, perhaps an ACS engineer uh, to determine the orbit, um, available volume um, and available mass um, that's allowed by a mechanical engineer. So um, these are all discussions that need to happen very early on in your design process. And if you determine that there's not enough radiator size, right, uh, or not enough, um, you know, surface area to mount your radiator, um, you know, something that you could bring up to the mechanical engineer is that are, are there other faces where additional radiators can be placed? Can you increase the volume allocation? Can a radiator be thicker or can it have heat pipes embedded? Or can operational loads be reduced um, or made less stringent so that you don't need as large of a radiator? Um, if you're trying to iterate heaters with other engineers, right, uh, you might talk to your electrical or your power engineer. Um, or you might try to relax temperature constraints um, for other disciplines, right? So can temperature requirements be made less stringent? Um, can electrical provide more power? Um, can the heater be placed closer to the component or directly on the component, right? And can electrical accommodate more heater services? 
this is something that um, is surprisingly not brought up because as thermal engineers, we typically um, just receive a set of thermal requirements and try our hardest to design to them, right? Um, but a lot of times what we see is that scientists, they might not actually need a particular um, thermal stability requirement or, you know, a particular temperature if you really push them on it, right? They might, uh, that might just be their goal temperature, whereas the threshold for acceptable science might be something completely different. So if you're having a really difficult time trying to um, control a heater or, you know, trying to design it to a particular stability, it's worth to ask um, to, you know, see if any of these can be relaxed. Um, you know, you have a lot of other design iteration steps with um, thermal transport and thermal isolation as well, right? Um, you can, um, a lot of these deal with mechanical, um, but of course, um, you can, you know, talk to other engineers about thermal stability and thermal uh, temperature limits, gradient requirements. Um, cryogenics is a really big one um, because a lot of iteration does have to happen with a cryogenics engineer. And a lot of these do concern parasitics to the cryogenic temperature zones as well. Um, so, for example, things like what compromises can be made between a cryogenic isolator ARL. Um, what kind of compromises can be made with a structural engineer, right? Uh, if you're a thermal engineer, you'll want something uh, that's as isolated as possible, but a lot of times for a structural engineer, um, that is um, not uh, rigid enough structurally. Um, one of the other ones is windows to a cryogenic enclosure, right? So um, obviously for an optics engineer, they would want um, the window to be as large as possible so that they don't have any vignetting for, for their particular signal. Whereas for a thermal engineer, you'd want something that uh, is fairly small so that you can reduce the amount of radiative parasitics. Um, so, you know, that's another area of trade that you can look into. And then finally for thermal sensors, right? Uh, you know, as thermal engineers, we typically want as many thermal sensors as possible, um, but they're not always accommodatable in the electrical architecture. And uh, in early conceptual design, this is where you'd want to start looking into, can we accommodate as many thermal sensors as possible? Because in later project phases, typically that's not uh, an option. And then finally, you have um, you know, performing uh, the seventh step, which is performing model checks here. So once you have a preliminary thermal design that's established, um, you know, you can perform these types of checks on your analytical model before running. So um, is, uh, for example, your instrument or spacecraft oriented correctly with respect to an orbit? Um, you know, you can uh, do a sanity check with the cube model. Um, for example, are the temperatures what you'd expect for the cold side um, or for the planet facing or sun facing sides? Um, and you'd be surprised also at how often this isn't checked, um, right? You put your, you build an instrument model, you place it into an orbit, and um, you're already uh, looking at the temperature results that come out without um, doing a sanity check of, do I expect that this part should be warm or this part should be cold? Uh, running a connectivity check is also important. If you add a heat load at one end of your model and the boundary node at the other, um, you know, and exclude radiation, are um, all your nodes connected? Um, you know, are there any unconnected nodes? Are there any duplicate nodes or surfaces? Are there any overlapping or coplanar surfaces? These are um, uh, really important checks to have as well. Um, check your active size and your optical properties. Are they what you'd actually expect? Um, you know, one of the things that um, um, is surprisingly omitted in, in, uh, in early model design is um, is this particular check. And you might have an internal surface that you weren't expecting to look out into space, actually look out into space. And as a result, you might actually get temperatures that are quite a bit lower on your instrument um, than, you know, um, well, temperature results that um, look very much lower than they actually should be on the instrument. Um, are the, your MLI nodes on the correct sides, right? Are they arithmetic? Do they have the correct E star values? Um, do um, contactors make contact as expected? Are they connecting the right, correct sides or edges? Um, are you um, having the correct power dissipations in the correct cases? Um, keep in mind, symbols really help here. Um, if you change a particular case, right, um, you can have those symbols automatically change based on that. Um, and that way you don't really need to worry about it. 
And then for any spinning components or articulators, are the correct surfaces spinning? Um, if you set that articulator to a different value, does it create the right motion that you're looking at? And if there's any view factor sums that are not close to one or there's thermal masses that are much higher than average, right? Um, it's really important to correct those. And then finally, are your heater controlling to the right expected temperatures and any are any of your heaters saturated? So um, these are some of the typical goals. You know, you know, I've been talking a lot about right um, the rapid thermal design process and all the steps that are taken uh, within um, you know perhaps the span of one to two weeks to actually uh, create a conceptual design. Uh, but what really are the goals? to achieve from this type of thermal analysis. Um, and uh, in the IDL, you know, we have a lot of different goals uh, that can actually be achieved, but um, these are some of the, you know, the common ones that, and the common um, results that you're, you'd actually look for, for from this type of analysis. So um, a big one, of course, is temperature control approach and design, including a block diagram and a thermal model. Um, you know, you would get your required information from your science team, temperature stabilities, observatory orbit, uh, the operations concept, um, and then your required information from other discipline engineers. And then um, you'd make assumptions to the orbit, the beta angle, um, and eclipse duration, um, use of conductive coatings, uh, nominal temperature ranges, right? If you have something that's embedded within an observatory or spacecraft, um, you would calculate bounding hot, cold, and survival cases. Um, any considerations needed for ground testing, design limitations, and then um, ultimately you would determine your ability of your thermal design to meet requirements. And, um, you know, it's okay after the first thermal analysis to realize that something is broken on your thermal model. And when I mean broken, I mean that it doesn't meet the thermal requirements that you're aiming for, right? This is your first iteration of your conceptual design. But what it really helps you to do, even if you identify that something doesn't work, what it really helps you to do is that it helps you to identify where the thermal challenges are for the next iteration. Um, the, uh, you know, some of the other things that you might actually look for from uh, a goal of a, a thermal design, a, a rapid thermal design like this, is um, the location and the number of temperature controllers and sensors, uh, parasitic loads uh, into cryogenic regions, right, especially if a cryogenics engineer is working with you. Um, they'd want to determine and iterate, right, what, um, uh, what the parasitic loads are and if they can minimize them. Um, any coding recommendations for radiators or MLI, uh, temperature contour maps, for example, if, especially if you're trying to look at the gradient that forms on an optical bench or some other component. Um, required instrument operational and survival heater power. Um, incorporating dissipations from powered instrument components, right? Um, quantifying engineering resources for thermal control, including the generation of uh, things like a bill of materials. Um, this is where that table that I showed earlier of uh, those typical masses um, really helps uh, in determining what the overall thermal mass, uh, thermal subsystem mass of your instrument is. Um, one of the things that we, um, you know, in the idea we ask, um, thermal engineers to do is to do a tier all assessment as well, or a technology readiness level assessment. So sometimes that, um, especially for um, newer or, you know, um, maybe not yet flown thermal components, it really um, talks to, right, how, how mature that technology is and, and perhaps informs, uh, you know, a project manager um, as to what the risk of using that particular component is. Um, some of the other goals from thermal analysis, you might um, look at things like the uh, transient temperature within a thermal zone as well. Um, you might look at radiator placement and orientation. Uh, it can you know, be used for determining right, where it would be most effective to place your radiators. And then your radiator size and temperature uh, per thermal zone. So now let me um, just wrap up this section with talking about um, how this all comes together. And, um, you, you know, you're probably wondering, right, I, I went through a lot of material here and um, there were certainly a lot of steps to uh, doing the rapid thermal design and analysis um, and just certainly a lot of considerations to have. How do we do this within the course of a week or two weeks, right? Um, is that really even feasible? Um, and 
Uh, what I'm pre presenting here is just an example schedule from um, one of the instrument design lab studies. Um, and this talks um, kind of to, you know, things that you need to focus on um, as you're gathering your, your requirements, as you're executing your thermal analysis, so that um, you can be the most efficient possible and to, you know, achieve those goals that you're actually looking for by the, the t within the time frame that you're looking into. So um, in the, the instrument design lab, we typically have, um, you know, if we're executing a, an instrument design, we typically have what's called a pre-work meeting with the customer. And, um, you know, a science um, principal investigator, for example, would come, or a member of the science team would come in, they would introduce their instrument concept to an entire engineering team. And then the thermal engineer at that point would be responsible for ensuring that they have their design requirements from a, a science team. So this might not be every single requirement, right? But certainly what's um, necessary to achieve the science that they need should be concentrated on at this particular point. Um, so if they need to be, you know, a detector to be at a particular temperature and stability, that information should be presented by a principal investigator so that you have it to execute your thermal design. Um, we um, typically after that have things like um, targeted pre-study meetings as well. Um, thermal engineer, um, from their pre-work meeting information, they can determine boundary conditions, they can determine worst case thermal environments. Um, a thermal engineer can also meet um, for targeted discussions with other engineers, such as, you know, for example, thermal and cryogenic zone interfaces, right? Um, so that, or if, you know, if a thermal distortion analysis is desired, maybe talking with the structural engineer to talk about um, what types of information is, need to be passed from the thermal engineer's model and how do they map to a structural model. Um, so, Often um, for our design studies, we then launch into what's called a study week. And a study week is uh, consists of a couple of design days. And within those design days, um, engineers are designing concurrently, collaboratively with the science team through a series of discussions. Um, each of them are focused on specific topics that impact a conceptual design and are aimed towards reaching a design decision. So this is where you see um, these other steps actually start taking place, right? Uh, steps three through six here. Um, and through consistent interaction with all the other discipline engineers um, that are part of your team, um, with interactions with a PI as well, to understand where they're trying to take their instrument and what types of goals they're trying to achieve, right? Um, these help the thermal engineer gather model inputs through exchanges with other discipline engineers, determine temperature zones with help from the systems engineers, set up a thermal model, and then iterate the technical design with other disciplines, including identifying any thermal challenge areas, and then pushing back when necessary. Um, after a couple of design days, um, we often freeze the design. Um, so what I mean by freezing design is that major discussion on the design completes so that the engineering team can focus on quantifying um, the resources and necessary to actually achieve that design as well as cons ensure consistency of the design across disciplines. So the thermal engineer here um, is provided with the engineering resources of the frozen design. You know, if you have a systems engineer, for example, they can help you amass um, the, the temperature requirements um, for you know, all of the components, the um, uh, the the masses, the powers, the volumes that are there, and um, you can get a mechanical model from a mechanical engineer to start um, finalizing your thermal model, right? Um, the thermal engineer now can complete modeling with the final parameters, perform model checks, and generate analysis results. Um, now, often, you know, uh, now uh, for a typical uh, study in the instrument design lab, we would have um, presentations back to the PI team after um, um, you know, after that thermal modeling and thermal analysis are complete and we do it very much like a design review um, with all of the different disciplines that are uh, presenting um, their conceptual design back to the PI's team and then um, at the end we just do an internal wrap-up to quantify to make sure that we're all on the same page to make sure that uh, we quantify all the engineering resources that are necessary for each discipline. Um, so for thermal, this would be radiator area, number of heaters, operational and survival heater power, and then number of sensors, um, and a lot of the other components. Uh, do you have a reference for the mounting interface conductances you had on slide 13? Curious what your estimates came from. 
where your estimates came from? Oh, uh, so a lot of these come from the thermal engineering branch um, parameters at Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, I also try to incorporate some of the other um, uh, guidelines um, from across the agency. So one of them, for example, is from Langley. Uh, so let me start on, um, let's start talking about some of the specific instrument thermal design examples, uh, you know, for um, different types of instruments across the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, I'll start with this diagram here. Uh, which really just shows you, right, the, the types of, um, well, the, the different um, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, um, including, you know, the, the longest wavelength down here for radio, um, all the way up to, you know, the, the shortest wavelengths, the most energetic particles um, out for gamma ray. Um, so um, this kind of shows you where these instruments occupy. Um, along the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, microwave or RF instruments, um, you know, they're, um, they typically occupy this band um, for optical instruments, laser instruments here, you know, and then of course you, you get onto the, the more energetic ones down here. Um, so uh, as far as instrument examples go, right, a lot of these are, are uh, robotic instruments. Um, some of these are earth observing down here, um, soil moisture active passive um, for some of the longest wavelengths down here, um, the advanced technology microwave sound around JPSS. Um, uh, you know, you're operating about or about this type of um, frequency here. Um, then um, you get onto the mid infrared uh, instrument for um, more of a, 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 of a longer infrared wavelength um, on the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, getting onto the optical instruments and the laser instruments, right? Um, you have a laser, the Advanced Topographic Laser Altimeter System, or ATLAS on ISAT-2, which is a laser altimeter, of course. Um, the Ocean Color Instrument on PACE um, is also, you know, meant to observe um, all the way from the infrared out to the UV. Um, and then for X-ray instruments, the example I have here is um, the soft X-ray spectrometer on Hitomi. Um, and uh, coming out to the most energetic instruments, you have um, the, the large area telescope on Fermi. Um, so let's start talking about the, the um, you know, microwave instruments first, and then we'll slowly progress our way towards um, a lot of the other different types of instruments uh, that I presented on the last slide. For microwave instruments, um, it's uh, essential to ensure that your antenna and feed horn placement is frozen before starting thermal modeling. So one of the things that um, are very common with microwave instruments is that they have some type of antenna reflector out here. Um, they have a feed horn that actually receives the signal from the antenna and then um, that directs it to a waveguide to take it to an RF receiver. Right? Um, this distance between the antenna reflector and the feed horns really should be solidified prior to any type of thermal design uh, starting. Uh, simply because right, any, any changes within that distance can result in a very different thermal design. Um, for an RF receiver, typically when you have an RF receiver at this early stage in conceptual design, you don't need to model the individual RF components in there. And there, there would be a lot of them, right? Um, so an RF receiver, you know, you would have things like uh, low, low noise amplifiers, you might have things like oscillators in there, right? But they're not really, um, it's not essential to capture all of them. And uh, typically um, you would have the same thermal requirements or at least you know a common subset of thermal requirements for all of your components within an RF receiver. Um, so conglomerating the heat dissipations of all of the RF components they, and just spreading them over um, whatever box or bench that they occupy is sufficient resolution at this stage of thermal design. Um, now for things like radiometers which are very temperature sensitive um, you would want to um, provide thermal control on the RF bench or box enclosure to meet those requirements. Um, it may be pretty strict thermal stability requirements for components upstream of the first low noise amplification stage. That's where um, you're, you're, you know, you're starting to worry about um, how the surrounding temperature and the surrounding environment of your components actually affect your science signal. Um, and uh, waveguides um, from uh, the antenna or feed horn to an RF box, so the waveguides that are shown here, may also have strict operational temperature and stability requirements. Uh, now, typically, if waveguides, you know, do need to be modeled, they can be modeled as tubes, um, very similar to propulsion lines, and then controlled through blanketing and through line heaters. Um, however, when you get into an RF receiver, because you're controlling the entire box here, you don't necessarily need to model the waveguide components within. 
um, that are connectorizing the different RF components. Uh, any downstream electronics boxes to digitize or process an RF signal? Um, you know, if it's still an analog signal out here, if you're trying to, uh, before it's digitized, you might have certain proximity requirements for, let's say, coaxial cables or other things um, that go between these two boxes. Um, if this is the case, um, you know, also if you're um, having digitization and, uh, of your signal and then if you have, you know, for example, maybe compression of your signal later, um, or compression of your digital data, I should say, later. Um, often what we see in RF designs is that there may be a succession of multiple high heat dissipating boxes next to each other afterwards. You know, one for digital signal processing, one um, perhaps for, for compression, or it might just be the, the main electronics box of your, your, your instrument. In which case, um, uh, often they can just be grouped into one thermal zone and a common radiator can be used for them. So um, this is just meant as a, a, an overview of a typical passive, ther uh, passive thermal design for a passive microwave uh, instrument, but you can get you know, fairly uh, more complex with um, active microwave instruments. So the second slide here really talks to um, those active microwave components. And um, this same RF thermal design considerations for passive microwave systems do carry over to active systems, but now you do have the addition of high heat dissipation transmitter components. Um, so power amplifiers, for example, if you have things like a radar, right, an active radar, um, power amplifiers tend to be your largest source of heat dissipation and power distribution units can also contribute to large amounts of heat dissipation. Um, and those are, you know, um, things that that's certainly heat that the thermal engineer would be um, responsible for uh, removing from an active system. Uh, many passive, uh, active and passive systems also use a rotating reflector. Um, now, if you have a rotating reflector, for example, um, if it spins sufficiently fast enough, a fast spin option in a thermal program can be actually used um, to capture the thermal effects of this component motion. Um, but, you know, one of the things that you might want to consider is that your mechanism, because you're constantly using it at a high duty cycle, right, your mechanism may have large heat dissipations from their motors as well, and they may require thermal control to ensure that their mechanical lubricants and drive electronics don't exceed uh, their allowable temperatures. Um, Oftentimes, um, we see deployable reflectors as being uh, more common, and these can be very, very large structures. Uh, so um, the example that I gave, the soil moisture passive active, or active passive, I should say, um, spacecraft, right? Um, that was, uh, it was out of JPL. Um, it actually, I believe, had a, a six meter deployable reflector, and uh, I, I could be wrong on that number. Um, but the deployable reflectors, because they're so large, right, they typically don't require any active thermal control, but their material properties really do need to be correctly captured. Um, and, and, you know, it, because they're just such a large surface area, they, they um, represent um, such a large source of radiative heat transfer, right? Um, so uh, often, you know, if they're a mesh material, then um, capturing the correct properties of the mesh material, including transmissivity, as well as capturing the properties of those ribs and stiffeners that are holding it up uh, are actually necessary. Um, feed horns, waveguide transitions, they might require thermal control as well. Um, a lot of times you might just need thermal knowledge so that they can calibrate their science data later. And then a lot of active and passive systems also use things like external calibrators. Um, so if you can imagine this antenna reflector that's you know rotating constantly, at every single time that it rotates, um, you might have it look at a cal hot calibration target and a cold calibration target so that the rest of its, um, its view, when it's gathering science data, um, it has um, essentially microwave information to science information to correlate against a fixed temperature. Uh, in which case, if you have a hot calibration target, uh, you know, they might ask you to hold it at room temperature with a, um, a particular stringent uh, stability requirement uh, so that they know exactly um, what the temperature of um, is for the, the calibration target that they're looking at. Um, so, you know, in, in those cases as well, it's just something to be aware of, right, that that might be an additional area of thermal control. Uh, now, moving on to optical instruments. Um, optical instruments, they typically encompass the IR, the visible and the ultraviolet 
portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, infrared instruments, they often require cryogenic operational temperatures and strict temperature stability and gradient requirements. Um, the, you know, uh, for IR instruments, very often you're trying to measure heat uh, emitted by a, a particular, um, you know, uh, astronomical target, for example, um, in which case, you know, you'd want to keep your detectors cold. Uh, for visible and UV instruments, they often don't have cryogenic temperature requirements, um, but, you know, um, depending on the case or what they're trying to observe, um, there might be um, certain control requirements as well. Um, this goes, the second bullet here goes back to the point of ensuring that an optical model and optical element placement is frozen before starting thermal modeling. Uh, and the reason for this is because, uh, right, if you have a, an optical component that actually changes um, midway through your thermal design, um, then your thermal design method has to change along with it. So let's say suddenly, right, the, the optical component, the, the, right, the optical design gets longer, right, then your thermal your optical bench design might actually um, have to increase as well, right? Your, the, the dimensions of your optical bench, in which case your thermal control method for that has to has to change as well. The, the amount of heater power, for example, that you actually use, where those heaters are placed. Um, and one of the other things that we've actually seen is that, um, for example, a fold mirror changes that then places your detector far away from your radiator than, um, than you know, previously being close to your radiator. Well, now you have to figure out how to transport that heat from your detector all the way out to your radiator. And, you know, previously where you might have used a thermal strap, for example, that just directly linked your detector enclosure to uh, a radiator, now you might actually need to use um, a heat pipe or some other type of heat transport um, component. So, um, you know, this is why we typically ask, right, that um, at least an iteration of the optical design is frozen prior to any thermal modeling uh, occurring. Um, and then use your requirements to determine what's thermally important to model. Right? There might be very complex optics for a particular optical instrument, but if the optical bench just has a thermal requirement and not the individual optical elements, it might be just sufficient to, op to model the bench. You don't necessarily need to model every single optical you know, lens and mirror and, and other component on that bench. Um, things that also require one-time actu actuations or, you know, or very infrequent actuations. Um, for example, uh, things like a filter wheel or, um, you know, or uh, any particular type of mechanism, um, you know, perhaps like an aperture cover. Um, they, they really don't need to have their heat load modeled at all. If it's a really a one-time actuation, it's just going to be, you know, a, a very brief transient effect, right? You're trying to understand worst cases here. So uh, it might not be um, useful to, to model that particular heat load at all. Um, so within the following pages, I'm going to give a couple of uh, instrument examples for um, different types of optical instruments and how you might address them with a thermal design. And uh, I'm going to start with an easy case and then it'll get progressively difficult, uh, more difficult with, um, with thermal requirements. Um, now, I talked a little bit about this in the previous section with um, cryogenic requirements. Um, but for any cryogenic requirements, a thermal, a thermal and or cryogenics engineer, they should mo focus most of their design effort on the cryogenic enclosure for the detectors because parasitic heat tends to be a large contributor to heat within the cryogenic zones. Um, a lot of times even more than the detector heat dissipation itself. Um, so it's, uh, it's just very helpful to, to be organized here, right? To keep a detailed list early on of all of the components which dissipate heat and have high thermal conductivity. Um, you know, there's design trades to be made with a structural engineer to talk about um, what is acceptable an acceptable compromise for isolators um, with an optical engineer for cutout and baffle sizes, uh, especially if you're talking about, uh, you know, the, the aperture that goes into a detector enclosure. And then with an electrical engineer, agree on wiring material and cross-section that ensures that you have enough electrical signal, but minimizes conductive parasitics. So, you know, perhaps if they can accept constant tan as, you know, the wire material rather than copper, you know, go with constant tan instead. So let's start with a, a simple uh, optical system, right? Um, so what you hear, see here is uh, there's an optical bench here with optical components on there. You might have a detector enclosure 
with a, a baffling or a window here and then a detector mounted within on isolators. Um, yeah, it might have front end electronics that read out the signal from those detectors and then uh, they transport it down to an electronics box to digitize that signal um, or, you know, to, to maybe compress the data um, or, or do other things with the science data. Um, your detector temperature requirements and stabilities, they typically dictate how complex of a thermal enclosure you might require. Um, you might not even need a, a thermal enclosure that, that I show here if, you know, your detector requirements aren't that stringent. Um, uh, really, that, that's there to minimize the amount of radio parasitics. Um, you know, for example, um, uh, opti for optical components, right, you, you might want to speak with your optics engineer very early on to position the detector such that it's thermally favorable. And sometimes in early optical designs, there is leeway to do so. Um, so, you know, of course, addressing the issue early is the most important. Um, one of the things to, to keep in mind here is to take note of any optics that have more stringent temperature requirements or heat dissipations, such as things like a scan mirror with an active mechanism. You know, if you're, you have a scan mirror, it's going to, um, very often it's going to be operating 100% of the time um, when it's acquiring science data. So, um, you know, for that active mechanism, you're going to have pretty large heat dissipations there and a um, for example, a, an early area of thermal concentration would be to make sure that you're matching the optical temperature requirement, the temperature requirements of that particular um, optical component, while making sure to meet the thermal requirements of your mechanism as well, and siphoning the heat out from your mechanism. Um, if there's optical components that require active heating, determine from the optical engineer whether a heater can be directly mounted or if it actually requires indirect radiative heating from a nearby heated plate, for example. Um, and that indirect radiative heating is, is very, very difficult, right? Um, so, you know, one of the, the examples from the James Webb Space Telescope is that a lot of their mirrors could not be directly heated. Um, so it required a separate, um, you know, heater surface to actually just radiatively heat that optical component, but as you can imagine, right, the, the the times that actually are, are are needed to change the temperature of that particular optical component um, are are uh, very excessive um, because you just don't have that direct thermal control. Um, so, you know, one of the the really early uh, design trades is to speak with an optical engineer and see if you can actually. Uh, mount a heater directly to an optical surface, or if it does require some type of indirect heating. Front end electronics boxes and electronics boxes, um, they, you know, they typically have different um, thermal requirements in the detector. Um, and these speak to the components within, right? And um, because they're not actively acquiring, um, or they don't really have an active area to acquire photons like a detector, right? Um, you, um, they're not as tied with the radiometric analysis. So you might be able to put front end electronics or electronics boxes in separate thermal zones um, that don't require as stringent of a thermal control. Um, and of course, placement of these components that can be negotiated with an electrical engineer to minimize parasitics into the detector, um, as well as you know, the materials that um, these wires are going into the, the detector with. Now let's get a little bit more complex. Um, so we have an actively cooled detector now, right? Um, previously, you saw the, the passively cooled detector that just has the heat strap uh, going out to a radiator. Um, if you have an actively um, cooled detector, you might have that heat strap going out to a cryocooler cold tip instead. In which case you've added these three separate components, right? You have a cryocooler cold tip here, that's siphoning out that heat from the detector. You have a cryo line that's connecting it to a cryocooler thermal mechanical unit. Um, sometimes these are the same um, component. It really depends on what type of cryocooler you have. And then uh, you have a cryocooler control electronics that's actually uh, controlling the cryocooler. Um, for mechanical coolers, um, sometimes you have multi-stage coolers. They might be necessary depending on your thermal requirements. Mechanical coolers, they tend to have pretty high dissipations um, for both, both on their thermal mechanical units and their crowd cooler control electronics. Um, they may require a separate radiator. Um, and, you know, if you do have the luxury of a crowd line here, it, it may be useful to actually have that crowd line divert to 
something like a, a radiator so that the thermal mechanical units or the cryo -cooler control electrons can be directly mounted onto that radiator. Um, modeling of cryo lines, I know I show it here, but modeling of cryo lines is actually really in, inconsequential in early thermal design. Um, really, you just need to you know, model a boundary as the cryo -cooler control tip and then, um, oh, sorry, accidentally uh, went a couple four and a couple slides there. Um, really, you just need to model um, a cryo -cooler cold tip um, as a boundary, and then the uh, thermomechanical units and uh, cryo -cooler electronics as their own separate boxes. Um, one of the other uh, things that we are seeing that are that's become much more common uh, as far as um, detector designs go is for the digitization from the detector signal to occur directly on the detector itself. Um, so that's a DROIC with an on-chip analog to digital conversion. Um, and often detector designers are pushing this because they don't need a separate front-end electronics box anymore. It's, it's you know, simplification in architecture on their end. But from the thermal end, this is actually not beneficial because it results in much higher dissipations within the cryogenic zones. And consequently, you would need a more powerful cryocooler than a traditional detector um, with a ROIC and a, and a warmer feet. So... Um, Another just early design trade to consider uh, with a detectors engineer is, do they actually need a DROIC, right? Um, and, and to talk about the thermal implications of having much higher dissipations on your detector, especially if it's a cryogenic detector. Uh, now, the most complex case here is a sub-Kelvin detector. Um, Sub-Kelvin detectors, what I mean is that they're below one Kelvin. They really present a unique thermal challenge um, due to the multiple required stages of thermal cooling and multiple methods of active thermal control as well. Um, there's many different ways to actually do this. You don't need to do it um, exactly the way that I showed here. But, um, you know, uh, very often um, for things like X-ray telescopes, these are, um, uh, these are requirements for the detectors, right? Um, uh, Hitomi, I believe, had a, um, had a detector that was down to 50 millikelvin. So it's, um, you know, extremely difficult to achieve those temperatures. Um, at, a cold, at the coldest thermal zone, um, your conductive parasitics actually dominate your total heat contributions within the zone. Um, so what I mean by that is that right, your radiative parasitics actually might be orders of magnitude smaller than your conductive parasitics. Uh, and certainly you, can, you see this under uh, 50 Kelvin, right? Your um, T to the fourth relationship for radiation, um, uh, especially if there's just very small, um, uh, you know, small differences in temperature between the, the radiative source and the sink. Um, they really contribute to very, very small terms um, as far as, as heat goes. So your conductive parasitics, which, is, which are linear, right, um, they um, contribute to a lot more heat into your detector enclosure. Um, so very often for you know, things like sub-Kelvin or even, you know, just a couple of Kelvin detectors, uh, we wouldn't even consider conduct, or sorry, radiation in, um, in the thermal design, we would just consider it conduction alone. So let me walk you through this design a little bit because I know it's, it's probably pretty confusing based on the, all the boxes and everything in the diagram. Um, but you have your sub-Kelvin detector here. Um, your sub-Kelvin detector is actually within its own enclosure. Um, it might go to a separate front-end electronics. The signal might go to a separate front-end electronics. But its heat is being siphoned out to an adiabatic demagnetization refrigerator. Um, and uh, very often, right, these um, ADERs, they're, they're very good at, at achieving very, very low temperatures, but they also only siphon out a very small bit of heat. So these detectors, they really have to be very uh, low heat dissipation. Um, and then um, the sink temperature for an ADR might even be just in the, the couple of Kelvin. Right, so it's it's achieving maybe 50 millikelvin or 100 millikelvin here, but then it's it needs a sink temperature of just a couple of kelvin. So then it it itself has to have its own heat taken out by a cryocooler, and that's actually why you see this separate um, you know, intermediate cryogenic enclosure here. So you're trying to um, achieve really really cold temperatures around your detector, but this separate cryogenic inclusion is just to achieve those couple of Kelvin that that sink temperature needs to be uh, with, you know, while minimizing the amount of radiative parasitics. And then that ADR um, siphons out its heat to a cryo cooler. And of course, you know, um, that heat actually, um, for example, goes to a, 
uh, a cryo line or you know even possible additional stages if you need additional cryo coolers to achieve that. Um, to you know, and and you see the more typical thermal mechanical unit and cryo cooler control electronics architecture here. Um, your ADR um, has its own control electronics as well, occupying a different thermal zone. Um, you would have to need you have to worry about. Uh, your conductive parasitics actually going in from your ADR to your uh, control electronics to your demagnetization refrigerator. And then um, remember when I said that, um, you know, conductive parasitics are really, really high, um, you know, source of, or, well, they're, they're the primary source of um, parasitic heat into these really, really cold cryogenic enclosures. Um, so management of the conductive parasitics between the electronics box, the front end electronics, and then down to the detector is really important. And you might need something like a heat intercept for those harnesses right, to actually be able to pull out that heat before it goes into a detector. Um, it's just, uh, this slide really just reiterates some of the things that I've just said. Um, the design of sub-Kelvin systems is dominated by parasitic heat management. Um, ADRs can be used for cooling detectors to sub-Kelvin temperatures, but they may reject their heat to a single Kelvin, um, you know, to a cryo cooler cold tip at single Kelvin temperatures. Um, again, their, their ability to extract, um, the, the quantity of heat that they can actually extract is, is very, is quite small. Um, really that emphasizes the criticality of using isolated materials to minimize conductive parasitics to the coldest regions. Um, other low Kelvin or sub Kelvin cooling methods that have been used in space, um, cryostats and doers with a working fluid or a solid, dilution refrigerators, helium sorption refrigerators. Um, and then um, just a reiteration that harness heat intercepts are a good method for con conductive parasitic heat management. Um, intercept plates can be passively cooled. They can be tied to a particular cryo cooler stage. Um, and then, um, you know, all of those these components that go down into the, the cryogenic zones um, do have their own electrical wires uh, traveling to those cold cryogenic zones. So bookkeeping of the parasitics is quintessential to thermal management. Now let's talk about laser instruments. So laser instruments are a special category of optical instruments. Lasers typically have very tight thermal stability and gradient requirements, but, because, but they also dissipate large amounts of heat. Um, and, and this is because, right, you're trying to convert electrical power really to optical power um, for, for a laser. So um, it, it's, it's a fairly inefficient process. Um, loop heat pipes or um, other more complex forms of thermal transport and control are often needed for heat rejection while maintaining those, uh, that amount of hardware within thermal requirements. So for loop heat pipes, for example, um, you know, uh, they're, they're really intended to make sure that uh, you, you're being able to transport large amounts of heat that are dissipated from your lasers, but also to maintain a certain stability requirement that your lasers might need. Um, because, you know, you, you ultimately you're dealing with, um, uh, um, you know, with, a, with an optical train here, right? So you don't necessarily want um, your lasers to start pointing um, or to start having wild temperature swings and then uh, perhaps start pointing in the wrong direction. Um, laser control electronics also contribute um, to another source of heat. Um, and, and laser control electronics, they might be integrated with the laser itself. They might actually be separate to the laser. Both transmitter as well as receiver optical benches typically have gradient requirements to preserve the alignment of optical components. Um, you can imagine pointing is an extremely, um, you know, is extremely stringent when you're dealing with lasers. So um, a lot of times for laser transmitter benches or receiver benches, um, they can be cold biased, they can be controlled with heaters, or they could have more elaborate thermal control systems. Um, sometimes you might have a fiber coupled laser, and um, this is to allow the laser to actually, the, the highest heat dissipating components of the laser, uh, things like the optical head, for example, to actually be placed in a separate location from the optical bench and then uh, fiber coupled all the way over to the optical bench so that right, um, you don't have the highest heat dissipating components on your optical bench. Um, if a detector operates at IR wavelengths, it might require passive or active cryogenic control methods. This is very similar on the receiver end to the passively controlled detector and actively cooled. Um, actively cooled detector, sorry, passively cooled and actively cooled detector, thermal architectures that were presented before. 
Um, you might need a cryocooler as well. Um, you know, trades of cryocooler power and reject temperatures are therefore important there. Um, in Earth orbit, you might need an Earth shield uh, for passive cooling. And then um, because of the many different sources of heat here, so you have, you know, you might have cryocooler, uh, TMU and electronics, you might have a laser transmitter and laser control electronics, instrument electronics, detector front end electronics, and the different thermal requirements for each. Um, they you know, management of your thermal zones is very important here. So it might result in one large radiator or several large radiators held at different temperatures. So uh, this is the corresponding picture to the, the previous slide. Um, and uh, I'll just walk through this really quickly. The, um, um, so what I ta was talking about earlier was there's a transmitter optical bench here. Um, you might have a laser that's directly mounted to it or fiber coupled to it. Um, this is a, a fairly simple, um, you know, laser design, but of course it can be a much more complex as well. Um, the laser itself dissipates a lot of heat. Um, so, you know, you, you would want to tie it directly to a radiator um, and, and have a good heat transport method for doing so. Um, you might have pretty stringent requirements on your transmitter or optical bench for gradients. Um, on a receiver optical bench, this is, um, you know, but this might be an actually a separate part of your instrument. So laser you know, transmits a signal out. Um, if it's earth observing, for example, it bounces off the earth, it comes back, um, comes to the receiver optics. And then, um, you know, this looks a lot more like the uh, passively cooled detector, optical detector example that I had earlier. You might have a detector within a particular enclosure um, front end electronics to read that out. The detector could be heat strapped to its own separate radiator. And then you have an electronics box down here um, that's um, you know, perhaps reading or, or converting that signal or compressing that signal. Um, going on to X ray instruments. Um, so, X ray instruments that are often designed with two parts a mirror or telescope assembly at the front end and a separate sensor or detector assembly at the focal point. Now, um, these could be at large distances with respect to each other, but require tight thermal control with, within and between the assemblies to assure alignment. Um, so, you know, very often on, on X-ray instruments, and I'll, I'll actually show this picture here um, because it's a better representation. Um, very often on, on X-ray assemblies, you have um, things like a Wolter telescope design. That's what the concentric rings are. So an X-ray would come in, and there would be a series of mirrors in here that are at successively more glancing angles, right, um, to concentrate the X-ray. Um, keep in mind, X-rays are very, you know, very energetic particles, right? So uh, a typical optical design probably wouldn't work. Um, so the glancing mirrors within this uh, telescope assembly um, help concentrate the X-rays onto a detector that's much further down. Um, but the thermal control challenge here is that you would need precise thermal control uh, of gradients on your Walter telescope um, so that it doesn't go out of alignment. And um, you might actually require a lot of heater power just to achieve that. Um, so, you know, uh, control of X-ray instruments is, is, is you know, quite difficult. It's actually, a lot of times, it's a, it's a very um, complex ex exercise to actually do. Um, on the instrument bench and the mounting plate in, right, you would have uh, things like X-ray filters. Sometimes X-ray filters, they're, they're not really the filters you might think of for, for optical filters. They might be um, just, you know, thin sheets of aluminum, for example. They're really meant to, to filter out the optical signal from the X-ray signal. And then uh, you would have cryogenic detectors within here. Um, now, the detectors, what makes it very difficult also is that not just the alignment of these two components, but the detectors themselves. X-rays typically require very large format detectors, which, you know, it's a large active area, but from a thermal perspective, that would mean that it's a much more, um, you know, that there's much more radiating area as well, right? Um, so if you're, you can imagine if you're trying to achieve a cold temperature on your detectors and you're trying to achieve a certain stability, um, that would present um, a lot of thermal control challenges. Um, now I'm showing a passive, um, design here, but you can have an active design, um, you know, either mechanical cryocooler or TEX um, for uh, a particular detector. Um, many, very often, front end electronics are placed right next to the detector. They also 
um, have to be pretty cold. Um, and then they, they would read out to an electronics box down here. Um, and, and for stability control, very often detectors are cold biased, and then um, there's separate trim heaters on there to, to establish their stability limits. Um, so I think I've covered most of the things on this slide, um, but um, just a, you know, one last point here is that um, due to large heat dissipations, radiators for detectors can be very large, and Earth shields uh, very often are a common necessity among Earth orbiting X-ray telescopes to passively cool to the de desired temperatures. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, we see stationary or, or louvered radiator fins uh, as another option for um, achieving the right amount of radiator area. Okay, um, so at the most energetic end of the electromagnetic spectrum, we have gamma ray instruments. Now, gamma ray instruments, um, unlike X-ray instruments, uh, they actually, um, there's, there's no good physical way to concentrate gamma rays. Um, so, you know, you saw that the, with the Wolter design previously, um, even though there might be large distances between the front end optics and the detector, um, you're still able to uh, concentrate those X-rays onto the detector. Um, for gamma ray instruments, since there's not a really good way to do this for gamma rays, you just have large banks of detectors. Uh, so um, they typically require um, things like, uh, you know, multiple detector trays with a lot of detectors mounted on them, right? And then um, you have, um, as an instrument with a very large amount of detector trays, each detector dissipates a lot of heat. So really it becomes a, um, a, a problem of heat management. How do you manage, you know, flying something that that is almost like a uh, um, is like a, a rack of computers in space? If you want to even think about it that way, right? Um, when a gamma ray comes in, the way that they actually detect with gamma ray instruments is that um, you know, um, depending on which detectors register that gamma ray, they can reconstruct. Um, yeah, so let's say you had a, a gamma ray come in you know, this way. Um, depending on which detectors it actually hits, they can reconstruct the direction that the gamma ray comes from, as well as um, the energy of that gamma ray. Um, and because they're trying to reduce the amount of noise there, um, what's been found is that um, metallic hardware is actually really bad at contributing noise to um, acquiring gamma ray signals. So they typically require low Z energy materials, things like uh, carbon fibers, plastics, silicon, other select materials to minimize background noise so that the science signal can be obtained. Uh, unfortunately, right, uh, as thermal engineers, most of what we use is metallic and high Z energy. So um, thermally conductive carbon composites and epoxies are essential for these designs to help with heat management. Um, gamma ray instruments, they often require a large number of detectors they greatly increase heat, uh, these greatly increase heat dissipation. Um, sometimes you just, you know, because you're trying to transfer a lot of heat out, um, metallic heat pipes might be unavoidable because of the large quantities of heat to be transported. However, um, um, you know, if you're, if you can get away with APG, using APG, um, it's preferable to any uh, materials for heat straps and doublers. Um, if you're using these stack detectors or trays for these designs, right, this is an example of a detector tray. So it has front end electronics to read out the detectors, and then it has a certain quantity of detectors mounted on a particular tray. Um, it's really essential to flesh out the detailed design of each tray to ensure that adequate thermal control and heat rejection um, uh, can be achieved. Um, right, so you can imagine that even just producing you know, let's say each detector tray dissipates two watts. And even if you're just taking out half a watt um, from each detector tray to, you know, to make it a little bit more efficient, um, it, if you multiply that by 120 detector trays, that's a very significant amount of heat. Um, so um, very often thermal um, efforts concentrate on just the, um, you know, the, the optimization uh, of trays, um, the optimization uh, so that you, you know, you achieve as low dissipation as possible on your front end electronics. And then um, finally, just uh, an additional point is harness conductance has to be considered as a significant vehicle for heat transport. Um, 
when you have electrical harnesses in these types of designs, you have, um, you know, uh, you have one electrical harness going to each front end electronics. So, um, you know, if you have 120 harnesses, right, that's a lot of copper. Um, and you, know, you have to worry about management of that parasitic heat and as well as the ones that are actually produced on your detector itself. Uh, now let's pivot over to astronaut operated instruments. So astronaut operated comes in two different categories. Right? The, the two flavors of it are internal and external astronaut operated. Now, what do I mean by internal? Right. Internal means that um, they're instruments operated by astronauts within the International Space Station or another crewed environment. Um, so you can imagine um, things like Lunar Gateway, for example, or you know upcoming habitats on the moon. Um, you would have astronaut operated instruments there. Um, so unlike prior instrument examples that I just presented, uh, convection is now a dominant form of heat transfer because this is assumed to be operated within a pressurized crude environment. Um, so you, you can imagine, you know, this is um, something that's actually used this type of design, not just for astronauts, um, astronaut operated instruments is often used in airborne instruments as well, right? If you have um, something that you're, you're flying within an airplane, the design the thermal design would be very similar to something that's flown on station. Um, unlike prior instrument examples, convection, um, you know, of course, is now a dominant form of heat, heat transfer. Um, however, one thing to consider is that the transfer vehicle to the International Space Station may not be pressurized. Um, so often, um, instruments that are designed for station, even for use within station, um, needs to be designed for an unpressurized environment as well as for um, for nominal operations once it's installed in a pressurized environment. And, and that does pre uh, present a thermal engineering challenge, right? You're um, going to have to analyze both uh, with convection and no convection cases. Um, for stations specifically, instrument heat is typically rejected via a convective interface, whether through ducted air or piped fluid. Um, there are typically strict requirements for the quantity of heat that can be rejected from the instrument to those interfaces. And uh, instrument mounted fans um, could be uh, installed within the instrument itself just to provide additional invective, convective cooling. Now, there are some design challenges to this. Um, convective interfaces to crude vehicles, they might supply cooling air or fluid at a large range of temperatures. So they might provide you a range of, um, right, of input temperatures for your your instrument uh, anywhere from let's say you know 10 degrees c to 40 degrees c but if but obviously your thermal design has to handle the worst case so you would design for the 40 degrees c case and make sure that um, you can still you know, operate your instrument and keep in mind also free convection in microgravity is much lower than in earth um, so here's just an example for um, the express racks or expedite the processing of experiments to space station uh, racks for instrument installation on the ISS. Um, the, ins the interface documentation for the express racks do require that the instrument control systems correctly interface with the rack provided, payload cooling provisions, adhere to limits on temperature of returned air, avoid rejecting that heat out to the ISS cabin air, um, and then avoid rejecting the heat conductively to the other um, instruments on that particular rack. Um, and, and one last one is to maintain astronaut touch surfaces around to room temperature. So um, as you can see, just a lot of different requirements have to feed into anything that's handled um, by astronauts, especially within a crude environment. Um, if we pivot over to the external side, um, now we're talking about instruments that are either used um, by astronauts that um, out in space um, or, uh, you know, for example, on a lunar environment. And um, with Artemis, of course, we're seeing a lot more um, proposed instrument designs for the lunar environment. So um, astronaut deployed external instrument designs. They're highly dependent upon their operational scenarios. And before any design work, these top level design decisions have to be solidified. So, um, you know, Remember what I said in the first section about most of your thermal designs, they can just be run with steady state, um, especially for early conceptual designs. For astronaut operated instruments um, for external environments, these tend to be the exception because there's such a large variation in how the instrument is used and what environment it's actually used in. Your concept of operations here um, really govern 
right? Um, what uh, what's what power is being dissipated, and then what the thermal environment is. So um, things like the duration of the instrument deployment, right? The operational cadence. How often are you using it for science, uh, right? Uh, the extent of astronaut interactions, the instrument placement or relocation, or onboard power dissipations versus time. Those are the things that you would really need to worry about for astronaut operated instruments. Um, and also, right, is that um, is the instrument going to be designed for a particular operational scenario, or is it meant to be versatile for a range of scenarios? Uh, for the moon, this is especially um, difficult because right, if it's just being designed for a particular operational scenario, if it's a one or two time use, um, you know, you might not have to make the thermal design as robust. Um, we actually, um, but to give you an example of a robust instrument, right, for a range of scenarios, um, uh, just to uh, give an example from the instrument design lab, there was a, um, a PI that came in wanting to use their instrument um, for uh, both um, daytime and 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 to survive the lunar night, uh, and uh, you know the lunar night is fourteen days, fourteen Earth days. Um, so the uh, amount of time that you need, or the amount of batteries that you would actually need to survive the lunar night, um, you know they they had a handheld instrument, but they actually needed a cart full of batteries just to actually survive for that amount of time um, with their survival heaters. So. Um, you know, certainly that a, a factor like that, the robustness of your instrument really does feed into um, what your overall instrument design is and what your overall thermal design is. Um, the operational environment, uh, spaceflight versus surface operations, right? If you're on the lunar surface, um, it's dependent on the time and location on the moon. Um, and understanding solar illumination for that landing location um, during the duration of your surface mission is critical input to your thermal analysis. Um, NASA's Artemis program does provide very useful guidelines for instrument design, especially for astronaut touch surfaces or interfaces. So uh, typically for a touch surface temperature requirement, um, you uh, need to have that anywhere between negative 43 and 63 degrees Celsius. So those handled surfaces may actually require active heating. Um, heat sources as well as sink temperatures, they do change rapidly between areas with and without solar illumination. Um, and then, um, you know, you have to assume that if there, unless you impose a placement orientation requirement on an astronaut, then you have to assume that there's no dedicated cold side of your instrument or radiator placement. Um, operations in lunar shadowed regions may also require large amounts of heater power, especially if you want to keep batteries within operational limits. Um, so this is just an, an example of a, a typical right uh, um, astronaut operate instrument. Um, as I mentioned before, you might have heaters on touch surfaces so that um, it meets those touch surface requirements. Uh, radiators, if you're on a lunar surface, you might want them to point up so that um, you know their environmental loads are less. Um, but um, achieving understanding your solar flux vector versus time and your conox of the instrument may also be very important. And you may want to have thermally isolating feet to prevent conduction from the lunar surface. Uh, now, the, the one I'm going to conclude with is robotics uh, planetary landers for, um, or instruments on robotic planetary landers. Um, they're highly dependent upon their operational scenarios and their operational environment, including if any planetary or celestial body has an atmosphere, uh, how long that instrument is required to survive. For example, uh, if you're on the surface of Venus, um, right, uh, the, the design is going to be very different. I mean, you're essentially just trying to buy enough time uh, to do your science. Um, and then uh, you want to accommodate all phases of your mission, including cruise and descent. Typically for landers, they have multiple instrument packages on their decks. Um, these might include instruments like mass spectrometers, gas chromatographs, uh, and these have high power dissipations in operation. Um, even though these instruments typically require things like transfer gases or calibrants, um, they, they have extensive plumbing. Right? A first case, therm a first cut thermal design doesn't really require modeling of these components. Um, modeling at a high, you know, the, the components that have the highest heat dissipations um, is, is what's important here. Um, reservoir tanks for those might require additional thermal control though. So that's just something to, um, to be aware of. Um, 
again, these types of instruments, they are very CONOPS dependent. Um, so a good understanding of the instrument concept or operations um, can help you understand which instruments are dissipating heat at which points in the mission. Um, and for some lander or rover architectures, they might have things like pump fluid loops to maintain thermal control across multiple instruments. And then they might send their heat to a common radiator. In really extreme environments, you might need things like conventional or exotic thermal hardware. So uh, this is an example for Venus, for example, right? You might need a pressure vessel with thermal insulation um, to pr protect from the very, very hot um, uh, and you know high pressure Venus uh, environment. Um, any science measurements that you're doing, those penetrations through the pressure vessel are going to be your major sources of parasitic heat. So that needs to be uh, considered for, for uh, a design like this. Um, you might have your instruments mounted on an instrument deck with an embedded uh, phase change material um, to you know, uh, be able to, um, to prolong the amount of time um, that it takes to heat uh, your, your instrument components. And you might actually have a, a fluid loop to a heat sink as well to try to actively pump out um, that heat. Um, as you can see, there's a lot, use of a lot of different types of isolators here um, to try to make it as thermally isolated as possible um, to get as, as long of a science duration as possible on the Venus surface. Um, but keep in mind also, if you're coming through the Venus atmosphere, right, detailed knowledge of Temperature profiles, convective coefficients to the atmosphere is necessary for the thermal uh, design of the descent phase. So just as a couple of closing remarks, right? Um, this short course uh, was really meant to present the thermal design processes um, uh, of the IDL as a guideline for rapid thermal design modeling and analysis. Um, and uh, within the last section, I talked about tall poles or lessons learned um, for instruments across uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, some of the most effective and efficient methods for thermal engineers to quickly perform thermal modeling and analysis is to identify the worst case environmental scenarios through simple models, perform instrument thermal design to those worst cases, uh, to coordinate with other subsystem engineers to solidify boundary conditions, um, and instrument mechanical design as well as worst case heat dissipations, um, to understand um, the specific type of instrument that you're actually designing to and what the design drivers actually are. And you want to design to the heart of the instrument as well, right? So what details have to be included? Which details can be left out? Um, you want to determine what's thermally challenging and important so that you don't concentrate a lot of time on things that you know, might not be, you might not need to worry about until later mission phases. And then finally, um, you want to quantify any engineering resources and identify tall poles for your next design iteration. All right, so um, just a couple of acknowledgements um, for uh, Jennifer Bracken uh, at NASA Goddard who uh, supported this work, and then Carl Kotecki, Stephen Rickman, Ruth Edmondson, um, who you know, are at various positions across the agency for their dil diligent review and excellent recommendations for the content of this course. All right. um, thank you, and I can take questions at this time. It looks like there's a question for, um, are there any back of the envelope or spreadsheet type calcs um, due early in the process? Um, that, that's a really good question. So um, early on in the process, right? Um, it, it, I think it's, it's a very temperature, or it's a very instrument dependent type of, uh, type of question. So, um, you know, really back of the envelope calculations are just to, to um, understand the thermal environment that you're in. Um, but if it's a cryogenic, um, you know, instrument, for example, one of the things that you might want to do is to, um, you know, uh, quantify the, the amount of heat that actually can be, or you know, have, a, have an early um, estimation as to the heat dissipations and the parasitic heats that go into um, a particular cryogenic enclosure. So um, that might be a good guideline to start off with to understand, right, how, how much radiative heat, radiative parasitic heat you can tolerate, how much conductive parasitic heat you can actually tolerate. Um, you know, uh, early, early uh, once you understand your thermal environment, you know, an in, in early back of the envelope calculation might just be to get a, a ballpark as to uh, the radiator size and the heater powers that you actually need. It looks like there's a question on how to assess the thermal response on specific instrument when a heat flux source is present. Response on a specific instrument when a heat flux source is present, for like a valve jet or a thruster. Um, so, uh, very often for the spaceflight um, instruments that 
um, we're designing for. You know, there's not really a, a very uh, strong active source um, that's that's by certainly um, not a, a valve jet or a thruster. But um, you know, the a lot of the science instruments that uh, that NASA Goddard typically deals with. Um, they have a dedicated space on the spacecraft, um, that, and uh, you know they're very far away from any propulsion systems. Um, specifically, if there is a really hot you know, heat source that's present, though, you, I mean you would follow very similar design steps um, to address that. So, you know, um, for example, right, um, you, know, you, you, you would want to try to isolate your instrument as much as possible to it. Um, if it's a very transient effect, right, then um, it does, it may require uh, transient thermal modeling, um, you know, rather than the, the steady state analyses that I, I uh, presented earlier. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure if that helps answer your question or if there was a, something more specific you were looking for. Could you show slide 42? Any thoughts on how to model interfaces, adiabatic, constant temperature, constant heat flux? When you're talking about interfaces, are they for, or let's say, like instrument to spacecraft type of interfaces? Um, so it, if if that's the case, right? It really it's just um, a, a lot of times we just map, model them as as boundary nodes. So um, you know it would just be a boundary surface that actually that's actually held at a particular temperature, um, and then um, you know you would try to um, you would try to do your your heater controller or something else on the other end of that particular interface so that you would make sure that there's not uh, heat transfer between. And very often there are, um, you know, there there are requirements like that when you're interfacing with uh, an instrument with, for example, a vendor provided spacecraft. What thermal analysis software do you use slash find easy to use? Thank you. Okay, um, well, thank you for that question. Um, so I typically use thermal desktop um, and, and find that very easy to use. Although um, for very for fairly simple thermal models, um, uh, you could actually just directly use Cindafluent um, to, to model it out. Um, I, I realize that that's, you know, it, it, depending on, I guess, um, the, the thermal background you have, um, that might actually be uh, a little complex to execute. How do you ensure model model accuracy because many things can be unknown about the moon at certain times? Uh, that's that's a, also a really good question. So for lunar environments, it actually um, becomes a little bit tricky um, because, of course, you know your your lunar environment is is uh, um, is uh, changing quite a bit with time and with position, right? Um, so. Here with with Goddard, we typically have um, um, folks that just they they just model the lunar environment as part of their um, their their day jobs. Um, they're you know, typically lunar scientists, for example, and we would reach out to them for an illumination model of uh, um, you know of the particular location and the time frame that we're looking at. And through that illumination model, um, you can deduce um, the amount of solar flux as well as um, the directionality um, or direction that the sun is pointing in uh, with respect to your instrument. Do you have any recommendations for how to draw the line between what is critical to include in early slash conceptual phase thermal modeling to avoid wasting time on inconsequential elements of the design? Um, do I have any recommendations for it? Um, I, I would probably say, right, um, this speaks to the one of the last points I had on the, uh, the summary and conclusion slide, which is just to design to the heart of the instrument. So it might um, be worth a conversation with, especially if you're designing, right, um, uh, you know, uh, with a, a science team um, and, and under the guidance of a PI, it might be worth a conversation to the PI to just say, what about this actually matters to you, right? If you're trying to acquire your science signal, what's really the most important um, thermal requirements that I need to achieve versus, right, what's just a, a nice to have? Um, and that really feeds into, right, what your most important, um, what, what your, the most important parts of your design that you should concentrate it to. But also, right, if, um, uh, think about the level that you're actually designing at as well. Um, 
you know, if you're looking into boards, for example, within a, a, an electrical box, then that might not actually be uh, something that's um, um, that's useful at an early conceptual stage of thermal design, right? It, unless you're specifically designing that board, it might just be easy enough to just uh, agglomerate all of the heat loads that are within each specific board into a box and just have that as a as a box heat dissipation itself. Um, you know, I, I gave the example of uh, of optical and RF instruments, right? For optical instruments, it might just be um, useful to design to an optical bench uh, rather than any of the particular optical components themselves. RF just designed to the RF bench rather than the, the components. So really it, it kind of boils down to the level of detail that you actually need. And that's driven by science requirements as well as just overall, right? What can you, you know, take a larger conceptual view of um, early on versus what um, you'd have to, to concentrate on um, because it's it's quintessential to your science. Okay, great. Uh, no more questions have come in. Uh, but once again, we'd like to thank you for, you know, putting the time in and putting this present to get the presentation together. Um, I personally found it very useful. I think this is a rich topic area and it would be great if, you know, um, you know, this rapid or, you know, early, uh, it, it, I think it's clear to anybody who's been doing this work for, you know, even a short period of time, how valuable uh, this is. And, and you've definitely shown, I think, that it's uh, both, uh, it's both an art and a science. So <laughs> something that is uh, um, heavily dependent on experience, but there are real skills that can be taught. So um, once again, Hey, thank you. Thank, thanks for putting on a great presentation. 